So, Lenard, thank you so much for your time. Um, just touching the tip of the iceberg, your career in the NBA with the Clippers and the 76ers, mm -hmm. and also NBL Melbourne Tigers. So, thanks again for your time. I want you to take me back to before basketball, though. Taking you back before basketball, I was a young kid in Atlanta, Georgia. I was a sportsman. I played everything. The neighborhood had a bunch of kids. We played football after school. Uh, I had a skateboard, and there was a hill next to my house. And when I, when I finally got up enough nerve to ride down that hill, I fell three or four times. I got scratches on my legs. I'd always ride the skateboard back up the hill. So I think in a way that helped me with my jumping ability later in my career. Um, and people always ask me, well, you, why were you able to jump so high? I think that was the reason why. But yeah, you know, I, I grew up with um, two brothers and three sisters and they're all sports people. And so at home on the mantelpiece, there were trophies everywhere, and my sister was a cheerleader, one ran track, and I didn't have anything there, and my brother used to always tease me about it, so that's why I sort of got into the sporting world. Why did you choose basketball? I chose basketball because my senior year, my junior year in high school, I played American football, uh, gridiron, and I just wasn't big enough, you know. I played, but I didn't play. But I wanted to, again, wanted to, I wanted to, be a sportsman. I wanted to get those trophies up. And I started to grow a little bit my junior year. I tried out in high school and I got cut. And that sort of fueled me. I said, I, I, I play enough basketball where I'm, I should be good enough to make the, the junior squad. And in my senior year, I grew a little bit more and I got cut again. So I never got a chance to play basketball in high school. But then again, I was mad at myself and I was mad at the coach for cutting me and I was mad at the world. So every day I'd go out and train and, and get better. I was playing every day. And then all of a sudden after high school, I got a job at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, the newspaper plant. I was with all of my friends, everyone's there. And I just said, this isn't what I wanna be doing for the next 20 years. And I, I quit that job and enrolled in school at Georgia State University. And right when the, the two days before, after I enrolled, I was just, went on a tour of the campus and I walked through the stadium and there was this big sign on the wall saying tryouts. Now the first thing that came to my mind was I got cut twice, might as well give it a go. And I actually made the team, got a four year scholarship and the rest is history. What were the first struggles that you faced before your basketball career started? My struggles, I didn't, when you say struggles, I, don't, I didn't really have any struggles except being cut, being, being told I wasn't good enough. Um, and that sort of fuels a lot of people in different ways. For me, I knew I was putting the time in because again, after school, we had a park and I'd play every day. And you'd hear your friends saying, man, you see Lenari, he can jump, or you see Lenari shoot that three? So I felt good about myself. And I'm thinking to myself, why isn't this resonating with the coach? I'm good enough to be on this team, I thought anyway. And come to find out, I probably wasn't because the team won the championship. So the coach knew what he was doing. Um, but it sort of fueled me to, to, to get to, and it kickstart me to, to get myself going. And I, I, every day I'd play, every day. And again, when people say working on their games, I didn't work on my game. I was just playing every day. And by playing every day, I got better. Once you'd put in all of that hard work, when or what was the defining moment when you realized that you were on the right path to achieving those goals? Once I put in the hard work, I think once I, I got that scholarship, because again, I, I, I went to school to be a airplane pilot. I wanted to fly planes. And once I got the scholarship, it was, um, I went home and told my mom and my sister was there. And it, and it sort of eased the burden because she was going to have to help pay for my, my college um, education. So it sort of eased the burden there. But it was 32 guys that tried out and I was the only one to make it. So um, I think once I, I, once I put that uniform on, because that was my first real uniform, I never played on the team, but once I got that uniform on and once I played in that first game, I sort of said, well, I made it, but I'm on the way to making it. With your journey from then till now, who have been the most influential people in your life? I'd have to say my brothers, my brother, my eldest brother who, who sort of knew I was good before I did, because my brother worked at Delta Airlines and Throughout the week, they'd have competitions and they'd play. Like, they had a, a local competition. And I'd always go with them. And I, and like a couple of times, they didn't have enough players, so I'd jump in there. And then we'd get in the car and they always go, 
man, you ought to be playing basketball. So he sort of pushed me to get me going. Um, and then, when, you know, you're very impressionable when you're a little kid and you see superstars riding around in the nice cars. There was a basketball player named Eddie Johnson that played for the Atlanta Hawks. I remember seeing him in the nice cars and he had the pretty girls. And I, I was like, wow, I want to be like, you know, you want to be like that, you know, but without thinking about it. So those guys were sort of influential, I'd like to think. But my brother probably mostly because he, he sort of, he put that, he instilled that confidence in me to let me know I was good enough. And every day he was like, look, dude, you need to be playing with somebody. You need to, you need to try to do something. You need to be playing with somebody. And so, yeah, they helped me. I don't think in the beginning my mental toughness was there um, because I'd gotten cut twice. So you lose confidence, you know. I knew I, you hear that from your friends, you hear that from your brother, but when, when the coach tells you you're not good enough, and then that, that, when I went to college and saw those 32 guys there, and there's only one spot available, like they had, they had 11 guys chosen and there was one scholarship left. Well, I guess that tenaciousness kicked in for me. So. I had a great tryout, you know, and, and obviously it was, it was good enough to, to make the team. And, um, you know, I went from there, but when, 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 you, when, you, when things aren't going well, especially as a young kid, it's easy to lose that confidence. But I had strong people around me to help me to get over that. Yeah. So would you say that that's sort of key, I guess, um, coming up through a career at any age is to surround yourself with people who push you in the right direction? 100%, 100%. And I say that to young kids now, even when I coach young kids today, it's all about encouraging them. Yeah, yeah, back in our day, coaches were different. It's yelling and screaming and get over here and get over there. But the more you can encourage a young kid and, and, and help them, then the better they're gonna be in life, not just in basketball, in life. And I think um, that's the sort of stuff I've learned over my coaching journey and, and, and uh, helping the young kids. Yeah, perfect segue into the next question. So what would be the most significant moment of your life? So whether it be on court, off court coaching or your TV work now? I, I, I think making the Hall of Fame probably because when I had to give that Hall of Fame speech um, in front of, and this is the first time they'd done it, like they had every team in Melbourne down for the, for the, for the, for the break and all 12, 10 teams were there. And before, I had, before they announced it, everyone was talking and chatting or whatever. And then I think Andrew Gage came up and, and, and gave us a quick speech and everybody got quiet. I, it was, that's the first time I got really nervous. I, I'm not nervous to talk, I talk all the time. I can talk underwater, okay? <laughs> but that was the time I got really nervous and I knew I'd made it because now I got all these eyes on me and they showed this film clip of me playing. Yes, that's great, my career was great, but to be acknowledged as one of the best, I think lets you know you've done the right thing over your career. And um, it, was, it was a special moment, yeah. How does that feel, I guess, to be acknowledged as one, as, the, as one of the best? Because today I sort of find that successful people or even people that are just on the rise, they're so afraid to be proud of their achievements. You know, they get like pushed down, like, oh, you know, don't be arrogant. Yep. How do you handle that? There's a, there's a fine line, there's a fine line. And, and when you say arrogant, you, you, you can, it's easy, very easy to be arrogant in a, in a sporting field, very easy. Like, I, I think Australia do a crazy super job of pumping up all of their superstars. Like, yeah, in America, we, we have LeBron James and Michael Jordan and la, 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 la. But Australia, which I, the country I love, I live here now, I'm Australian. They put their, their players on a pedestal. They really put them up there. And, it's, and so when they fall, it's a long, hard fall. So you, you need people around you to keep you grounded. Uh, you need people around you to say, look, yeah, that was a great play, or yeah, you, you, you know, you've signed a major contract, but don't forget about the little people that helped you. Or don't forget about the disadvantaged people or the people that don't have. So, and that's the part that I think that kept me grounded. Um, I, you know, uh, yeah, there were times that I was a little bit arrogant about playing on the floor and I'm better than this guy and I'm better than that guy. But then when you're driving down the street and you see a guy with no shoes on, it, it, it slaps you back into reality. You know, you, at the end of the day, we're all human beings and we are, you know, we, you know, you, you gotta do the right thing by everybody. So, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So the Stitch Untitled slogan, not for the faint hearted. 
How do you vibe with that? Not for the faint heart, it means to me to give it your all, to, to, to push yourself to the extreme, I think. Um, if you're after something, if you, if, if you want to achieve your goal, then you got to put the work in at the end of the day. And I say that to my kids. There's no easy way, there's no easy way to become a professional basketball player. You don't all of a sudden wake up and go, oh, I made it. Every day, you got to get in the gym and you got to put the work in. So in order to be great, you have to push yourself. And the, the slogan fits perfectly. You know, I, I'm, I, want, I wanted to play basketball I, I, after school every day. And when I say after school, all day, every day, I mean every day, all day, because back then we didn't have iPhones and computer games. It was all about putting the time in here. And now when I'm training kids and we do an hour and they go, oh, I'm tired. No, bro, one hour a day is not going to do it for you. You want to be great. You want to, you want to, you got to put that hard work in to, to, to get the best out of, if you want the best, you want to be the best, you got to push yourself to get the best. Yeah. So. What separates average from great? Time and work, time and work. Sep you, you can be average, you can be an average basketball player. Yeah. You know, and I got other things, I'm doing other things, but if you want to be a great basketball player, then you have to eat, sleep, and breathe basketball. Now that sounds crazy, but that's the way it is. And that's with anything in life. If you want to be a CEO of a company, then you got to put that hard work in. You got to put the time in. Rarely does it just pop up that, oh, I'm lucky enough to be on this team. You're lucky enough to be on the team because you've done some hard work beforehand and the coach has picked you because he likes what you've done. You, you have to, you have to eat, put the hard work in. And, and that, and when I'm talking to my kids in my, in my camps, it's always about doing more, getting it more. Go home, get in 100 dribbles with your right hand, get in 100 dribbles with your left hand, get up 100 shots. You know, if you don't, if you're not doing that every day. And here's the thing, too. The thing is, your parents shouldn't have to push you. If you want to be great, if you want to be a basketball player, your mom shouldn't have to say, Johnny, get out of bed, you gotta go to practice. No, Johnny should be saying, mom, can you take me to practice? Mm. Uh, or, or mom, I'm gonna be late, I need to get to training. Or I'll catch the bus to training. Uh, because if you don't have that, if you don't have that in your, in, in, in your psyche, then you're not gonna be great. You know, it has to come from inside. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. You've met a lot of amazing people along the mm. way. What's the best advice you've ever been given that's helped your career? The best advice I'd have to, you know, it's, it's funny. I met a lot of people and I played with some famous people, Charles Barkley and Rick Mahorn and Scotty Brooks and those guys in the, in the NBA. But I think the person that's probably mo most influential in my game to, to help my game is probably Andrew Gaze because I seen his work ethic. When I, when I first got here, after, before every training, and people say this, and they just said to be saying it, but before every training, he was there before every training, getting in some shots. And then when everyone was, when training was over, and everyone grabbed, grabbed their bag, go to the locker room, take a shower, he'd still get up his four or 500 shots. And it's sort of, and I went, and we competed so much every day in training that it made us great as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a twosome. If he scored 20, I had to get 20. If he scored 35, I wanted 35. But what it was doing was making us a better team because now teams have to deal with both of us and not just one person. And I think by watching him um, put in that extra work, um, I started doing that after training. We started competing after training. You make, you make nine in a row, I'll make 10 in a row. And we got, we got very good at, at a certain stage and um, it, was, it was fun, it was yeah. fun, yeah. So we touched on this before about staying humble through success, mm -hmm. but what does it take to be Leonard Copeland? Now, the Leonard Copeland now, it takes just to get a nice guy to, I don't know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm as humble as they come now. I, I, I get along with everybody. There is no, I don't have any enemies. There, is no, there are no enemies, you know, that I, there's no one that I don't, don't, don't like, and I, I'm sure there's people out there probably don't like me, but. I just try to be humble as possible and try to help as much as I can, you know. I don't mean, um, and I bring my, I got four daughters and I try to instill that in them as well. You know, just, just be a nice person, man. Just, if you can help, help, you know, just do the right thing and good things will happen. And I think my parents instill that in me. So it's all about doing the right thing, enjoying life, 
but staying humble. Don't, don't, you know, stay grounded. Don't, don't get too high and don't, don't, don't get too low. Since basketball, I'm, 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 I've, I've had a coaching gig in Sydney. I've coached Big V, um, three or four different teams in the Big V. Um, and I coach, I do my own clinics, Leonardo Copeland basketball cam uh, camps and school holidays. And now I'm working with ESPN, The, the Jump, a show that comes on KO every Friday. And I'm also doing NBO games. I'm calling some NBO games, some commentary work. So the media stuff is starting to pick up, which I love. Uh, but again, you never know what's going to happen with media because it's all about, you know, the ratings and, and how things are going. So I'm not getting too high. I'm not getting too low. I'm happy with the experience to see what happens. And if things work out, fantastic. If they don't work out, then you move on and you find something else. Yeah. yeah. If it's not basketball, what would you be doing? In some kind of, in some kind of way, it will always be basketball because I've gotten enough people that, that want to know how I got to where I'm going to. So I'll do interviews or I'll, I'll train some kids or I'll do something. But I, you know what I'd love to do? I'd love to be a professional golfer because I'm working on my game. My handicap's slowly dropping, but not good enough. But we, we try to play once or twice a week. And I'm working on my game. Who knows? I, I, I don't know. If it, if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. But I, I love the game now. Yeah. Because uh, it challenges you every game. You're not playing against someone else. You're playing against yourself to get better. So, mm. so if there's a stamp you could leave on the world, what would it be? If there was a stamp I could leave on the world, it would be be kind to your fellow man. Stay humble. Do the right thing, man. Enjoy life because... You never know when it's your time. You know, you just, you just got to enjoy yourself. And, and, you know, don't get, again, I keep saying this, but it's so important, man. Don't, don't get, like, if, if, if you don't get too high, you know, don't enjoy it. Yes, have fun. But then don't get too low either. Never get, to, never get down on yourself. Always, you know, you, your, your worth is what it's all about. And if you're, if you're struggling with that kind of stuff, then talk to someone, you know, and, and, and Try to get around positive people and, and try, to, try to enjoy yourself. There's been a lot of changes in sport uh, along the years with encouraging people. What's your stance when it comes to everybody getting a participation award? Times have changed. Times have changed, man, because back in my day, back in my day, only the people that won got, a, got an award. Now, you reward the winner, you might give a second place a ribbon, and the third place might get a lollipop or something. You know, but the rest of the people, if they didn't, if they didn't, if they didn't, you know, if they didn't compete, if they didn't get to that level, then next time you go back and you work harder and you try to get to that next level. Now, today's society, I think the, the culture's changed where they want to reward everyone. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just a different, it's just a different era, you know, and I look at both ways as being positive. I can see the way we grew up because it helped me to, to, to get to that next level now because everyone can't make the team. So I got cut, so it made me work harder. So that's, that's what, you know, got me to the next level. But now, because you don't want anyone feeling bad about themselves, you give an award. So that's how they're doing it on this side. So I can see positives to both. But if I had to choose one, I'm choosing the one that got me to the next level, which is you reward the winner and the next, and you other guys, if you want to be a winner, you got to go out and put that extra work in. So that's, that's where I stand with it. Yeah, for sure. And I'm sure victory tastes a lot better when you've worked harder sweet, for it. Sweet, sweet victory. Sweet. So as I mentioned earlier, we've got three packs of NBL cards. Okay. Do you reckon we can find one of yours? Uh, if, if, if we're lucky, we'll find one. 1995, Series 1, NBL. Let's open her up and see what's happening here. Shane, the ha oh! <laughs> Leonard Copeland, there we go. Shane Hill, Leonard Copeland. I knew it was coming. Got it? Yeah. Got it, good. I'm glad we hit one. That's I'm cool. glad we hit one too. I got that card at home. It's a nice card. Are you still collecting cards now? I don't collect them, but I got enough of my own. Yeah. yeah. But I had a pack, I actually had a pack of all the, all the players 
in the NBL, and, I, and I'm, when I moved to Brisbane, I lost my pack. I left it in Brisbane somewhere, and I can't find it. So, yeah, but that's a good card to have. Thank you so much for your time. Really, really appreciate it. It was really insightful, obviously, to learn about your journey and what it took for you to get there. I enjoyed it. It was fantastic. You do an amazing job. Let's do it again soon sometime.